actually <laughs> this morning very learned inputs have established two clear facts one is all major religions judaism christianity islam have prohibited riba and the second also this prohibition is due to riba being unjust every speaker has affirmed these two now after this i try to explain my understanding of the wisdom of prohibition of riba so before i try to do so i have a word of caution when i or you attempt explaining the wisdom of a law of god we must admit in all humility that this is an human effort likely to be limited we cannot comprehend the limitless wisdom behind god's do's and do nots and the other thing is my understanding today as somebody is understanding 1000 years ago and somebody is understanding 1400 years ago people like us not the prophets is relative it's bound by the time and place in which we think when we try to explain the wisdom of prohibition of riba we look at what it is doing around us or what it is likely to do around us this is very important to realize because if we do not realize it that what i am going to tell today is a product of my environment i see riba practice around me doing something and from there i reinforce my argument why allah prohibited riba somebody did the same a thousand years or maybe 2000 years ago in context of and the religion but he was not seeing the environment which i am seeing he was looking at his own environment now take for example one fact most of the citizens of united states are lenders earners of interest either because they have a deposit howsoever small or because they hold some bonds but 2000 years ago and these people think that their deposits are going into business commercial use productive use 2000 years ago there were few lenders and most of the as people think most of the loans might have gone for needy people people in need of immediate cash to buy food clothing shelter etc etc now naturally the one who explained the wisdom of prohibition of riba 2000 years ago he was focused on consumption loans or what was related to money given to the poor the one who is doing today you should not expect him to be focused on the poor you should if he is realistic expect an explanation which applies to productive loans in the first instance not in the second instance and to a an exercise in which the bulk of the community is involved not few money lenders you see that makes the difference i emphasize this difference in explaining the wisdom of the law of god because this will prevent us from falling prey into a fallacy and what is that fallacy we take an explanation of the wisdom of prohibition of usury by a scholar before one or two centuries we find that the explanation is mostly focused on lending to the poor exploiting their needs from there we try to derive an inference that it is only consumption loans in which riba was prohibited that is not necessarily true you derive law from law not from explanation that is a very dangerous exercise if you derive laws from tafsir or from shuru or from uh, sayings of non prophetic people by people who were not get, uh, deriving their wisdom from god directly you are deriving from human explanations from time bound explanations 
even if somebody 2000 years ago 1500 years ago focused in explaining the wisdom of prohibition of usury or riba on loans given to the poor for meeting their needs that does not prove and cannot prove that only loans for consumptions in their context riba is prohibited because that is an explanation that is a product of environment we must go to the text of the law if that does not justify this distinction between loan for one purpose and loan for another purpose no person in any of these three religions or in whatever religion is right in confining the prohibition of usury or interest to a particular kind of loan now having said this i try to uh, be mostly confined to productive loans you see the unfairness of interest taking on a production loan productive loan profit earning enterprise is very simple if the person loses if the firm loses there is no justification of the financier claiming an increase because the environment is not so structured that whenever you put in something in a productive enterprise more than what you put in comes out and if the there is a profit even then a fixed rate of interest is unfair because the profit may be very large sometimes it is very large more than 50% 100% why should the financier be given only 5% or 15% or 12% which was agreed the fair thing to do is that you share in proportionate ways and not be fixed so either way a lending for productive enterprise should not be accompanied by a predetermined fixed rate of interest now of course there have been modern researches which go beyond this simple unfairness and we now see that this is a major contributing factor towards instability of our system the fact that productive enterprise be financed by predetermined interest bearing loans is a major factor contributing to the instability of the current system i cannot elaborate upon it those of you who wish can refer to a rather old book him minsky's a book on capitalism the inherent instability of capitalism i think it is more than 10 years old we have taken up the point and in major books on islamic finance including that uh, published by mohsin khan and abbas mirakhor and uh, some other books one of my chapters also we argue this how the rigidity introduced by obligation to pay back to the financier a predetermined amount at a definite date this rigidity as compared to the flexibility of the alternative in which there is a sharing arrangement the amount to be paid back depends on the performance of the enterprise it is not predetermined and sometimes the time of paying back is also flexible this rigidity introduces something in the system which may result in crisis in uh, collapse of the system now another point is and i think it is well recognized everybody is bothered about the increasing inequality in our society the inequality is increasing not only between nations the poor nations the rich nations but also within sections of the society even the us society i'm not saying that the poor are becoming poorer i'm saying only that inequality is increasing and i think the fact is in nobody can reverse this fact some time ago there was a good write up in in economist magazine also and there are many studies that the inequalities are increasing now i'm not saying that only because of interest but there are good studies available 
some in our literature that one of the major causes is interest. Look, it is very simple. Those who use their money to earn more money, they get a continuous increase, guaranteed increase. But those do not, who do not have money to earn more money through interest, either they have their skills, either they have their entrepreneur's genius, nobody assures them of a continuously rising income. So the workers, the entrepreneurs are at a loss, the rentiers, those who live by their accumulated wealth, they are at an advantage. And this is the main reason why inequality is increasing. So you have inequity, you have instability, you have inequity uh, in and inequality and instability. Three major ills of contemporary society are rooted in interest. Now, so far as Islamic economics is concerned, it has major contribution, it has offered ways to correct this in a way in which you don't have to abandon the financial intermediation system altogether. You change something here, change something there, and you avoid much of the instability, much of the inequality, and much of the inequity which resides in the system. It's not my subject today to explain how a combination of Mudarba and murabaha, of sharing and purchase and resale at a higher price, deferred for payment, can do this trick. But I will try to come to this point. Let me give a few minutes to consumption also. Now consumption today is of two types. One is very close to production, and that is when you help a person buy a house, a car, a refrigerator, durables, what we do. It's a well taken point that these things increase the efficiency of a person, the earning capacity of a person. So there is something to share. But that thing is diffused. It is uh, one of the unmeasurable things. So there are ways to finance consumer durables Islamically, which do not involve interest. Some people get confused that what is the difference between giving a person 30,000 to buy a car and tell him to return 50,000 over a period of years and to finance on installment as an interest-bearing loan or interest-bearing deal in which whatever the time on which you pay, the amount goes on increasing at a particular rate. There are differences. I will come to that point briefly. What I want to say is that this type of consumer who can repay more, he can be handled in Islamic framework also, he is being handled by the conventional framework. The second kind of consumer who needs money for his daily bread and clothing, that is a different category. Frankly speaking, he deserves uh, charity, sadaqa. If there is a loan, that should be on the, at par with sadaqa. That is what is commonly called, called the hasan. You give and take back what you give. No more. Now, why, why should people who fell behind, who would struggled but could not earn their living, deserve this? Well, you have to go back to the nature of human life on earth. Not everybody is healthy, not everybody is strong, not everybody. There are children, there are very old, there are invalid people. This is what human society is. Now, if you structure your institutions, your system, only to serve the strong, the able-bodied, the young, you are not going to meet the needs of society. A good system is, which takes into consideration these facts, that hum, human beings in the first few years and in the last few years of their full life, they need care. Human beings, some of them, are invalid. Some of them have diseases which prevent them from a full, healthy, earning life. They need care. Now, how 
can care come if you are not willing to share. So here comes the obligation, human obligation. Before, before it was made a religious obligation by the major religions for every able-bodied, well-to-do person to share. He, he should share because this is demanded by the nature of his society. He is not doing anything in terms of ihsan, as we say, generosity. It's the nature of life which demands that some share with others. So, the Islamic position with regard to meeting very dire consumption needs is that those who are in a position should meet these needs free. And the society itself should have some system. And you know about zakat, you know about satqatul fitr, so many other things have been built into the system for doing that. But not is the, that is not the subject of our talk today. Now, the system, present system, which allows money today to be exchanged by money tomorrow with an increase. That is the essence of the interest-based system. We have pointed out that there is a fallacy in the system. You cannot prove that money after a year must be more than money being taken today because in between it increases. It, there is an opportunity of increase and when that opportunity is materialized, of course there should be sharing. But often it does not materialize, so that eventuality should not be dealt with in the same manner in which the conventional system is doing. So what we have done in the alternative system I do not say alternative in the sense that you have to completely demolish the current financial intermediary, intermediation system, banking, etc., and build something new from scratch. No. You, have, you are able to change something, and the nature of the, the service which you are getting will change, will, be, will improve, will become better. And the main changes are in two places. One is that most of the things should be done, mobilization of people's saving on the basis of sharing. And the other is that when passing on this pool sharing to its users, we should not, of course we rejected usury, the fee for using, we instead use two, two methods, alternative methods. Wherever possible, we go for sharing. By possible, I mean where the increment can be monitored, can be measured, and both parties have enough trust in one another to enter into a sharing element. Otherwise, there are unmeasurables. There are things which cannot be monitored. So there, we resort to one of the trade weights modes. We have murabaha, we have leasing, we have istasna, we have salam. All these come to one thing that they result in debt obligations. The need is satisfied, the uh, production process is launched, and the financing comes from a source which expects back something definite, something predetermined. It's not a loan. Either the financier purchased something and handed it over to you for use in your productive enterprise, or leased something, or uh, in terms of salam, the deliverer of the goods, salam or istasna, gets time to deliver while he gets cash price prepaid so that he can use this cash for production of that thing. So these two taken together meet the needs and avoid the pitfalls, avoid the disadvantages of the system to which we referred. Now about inequality, uh, instability, I will just read one paragraph. Profit sharing finance synchronizes payment obligations of firms with its revenue accruals, thus removing a great source of instability in the system. In test-based finance subjects the firm to a rigid schedule in which the amounts due for payment 
as well as the dates of payment, do not take the current project status into account. This may oblige the firm either to borrow, usually at a higher rate, or to sell its products, usually at a much lower than expected price, in order to meet its contractual payment obligations. The third alternative would be default, which sends shock waves throughout the system. Now, it will be seen, uh, some other point, that Murabha Finance, all of you understand Murabha, the client comes and says, we want uh, such and such, such things, so many tons of phosphate from, say, Morocco. We don't have cash, you buy it and sell it to us at a higher price, we will pay after one year. So Murabha Finance, unlike interest-based finance, in this, changes in spending will automatically be reflected in changes in demand and supply of goods and services. No modern economy can function without credit. But the way credit is created in the absence of interest rules out the possibility of excessive debt creation or its continued accumulation. Now, this is our point that the credit creation at present is excessive and it goes on accumulating. It goes on becoming a amount of debt. Lastly, and this is the last half minute I take. Like many other evils, the practice of charging a fixed positive rate to loan capital has survived the strictures from all world religions and condemnation by all moral philosophers. In the earlier days, the role of capital in the economy was much less important than it is today. Humanity has much more to suffer because of making interest the kingpin of its financial system in a globalized world using huge quantities of capital. As briefly mentioned earlier, much of the inequity, inefficiency and instability of the modern economy owes itself to interest. It is also a major stumbling block in the way of a moral approach to global economy based on sharing of resources and caring about the weak and poor. It is time that the negative economic role of interest and its immoral nature was realized by all. The wisdom of prohibition of interest lies in the divine hand guiding men and women towards a better economy and a better society. Thank you.